on World News Tonight. Urgent rescues. India reels from the tragedy of Gujarat bridge collapse with rescue efforts discovering more bodies. Crowd crush. The Taiwan investigations are in full force, with the South Korean government searching for answers. Under fire. Ukraine faces a barrage of rocket fire as power outages become more frequent at the hands of Russian forces. And Fantasy Fleet. A masquerade fit for the most creative minds parade the streets of Florida. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. In India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Morbi district in India's western state of Gujarat, where a bridge collapse has killed more than 100 people in one of the worst accidents in years. We have other than a World News special correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekar from Delhi in India with the latest updates. Gayatri, what's the update on the rescue efforts so far? Yes, Sanradi, murky river conditions are hindering rescue operations with divers struggling for visibility under water after a suspension bridge collapsed in Gujarat. Claiming at least 141 lives so far, about 180 people have been rescued so far. A dozen rubber boats were seen on the river as part of the rescue on the day after the disaster, but the operation has made little progress since Monday noon. Gujarat is the home state of PA Modi, who said he was deeply saddened by the tragedy. The state government has announced a day of mourning in the state on Wednesday. Indian police arrested nine people, including the managerial staff, ticketing clerks and security guards, for failing to regulate crowds before the bridge crumpled. The tragedy, the worst in the country in many years, has now devastated people of Modi. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar reporting from Delhi in India. Amid growing calls for accountability, police and government forensic experts are continuing to investigate the circumstances surrounding the deadly tragedy in Itaewon, and South Korea police admit that the response was inadequate. A 475-member special police task force is continuing to investigate Saturday's crush disaster. The team is looking into how the crush surge developed and what might have triggered the crush in a narrow, sloped alley. Police officers have obtained videos from over 50 security cameras in the Itaewon area in order to recreate the scene and help figure out how it all happened. They're also analyzing video clips posted on social media. The team, together with government forensic experts, are also closely examining roads near the Hamilton Hotel and nearby stores. Over 40 witnesses and survivors are currently being questioned, and eyes are also on whether the Seoul City government and the Yongsangu District Office had proper safety protocols in place. Some experts say that no clear agency could have been in charge because disaster prevention methods don't apply to public spaces, where large crowds are expected to gather informally, unlike planned festivals and concerts. The police had announced on Monday that they don't have any specific procedures for handling incidents such as crowd surges during an event that has no organizers. South Korea's Minister of Interior and Safety said on Sunday that police didn't expect more crowds to gather for this year's Halloween than in previous years, so they didn't deploy additional personnel ahead of the festivities. Around 140 police officers were dispatched to the area on Saturday. Crossing over to the war in Ukraine, Russia launched a barrage of missile strikes against Ukraine, ramping up attacks and targeting major infrastructure facilities. Many in the country were left without water and electricity. People in many parts of Ukraine, including Kyiv, were in the dark and without water following a series of Russian missile strikes. The mayor of Kyiv explained Monday that 80 percent of the residents in the capital city had no access to the city's water supply after Russian missiles damaged a power facility nearby. He also added that 350,000 homes in the capital war left without electricity. Hundreds of Ukrainians had to queue at wells for water on Monday morning, carrying buckets, plastic bottles and even barrels. Not having running water is the least of what affects me. I can still come and get water. Another thing is when people are dying, this is the problem. 
The city said that the situation had improved slightly by Monday afternoon, but still nearly 40 percent of the capital remained without water and 270,000 homes still didn't have access to power. Ukraine's defense chief explained Monday that plants and hydroelectric dams across the country were targeted this time. He added that 44 out of more than 50 missiles fired by Moscow were shut down. Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva's supporters are celebrating his narrow election victory in Brazil, but there is tension in the air over Jair Bolsonaro's silence. President Jair Bolsonaro will not publicly address his defeat in Brazil's presidential election, a minister said, amid doubts over whether the far-right nationalists will accept the victory of his leftist rival. Truckers blockaded highways in some 20 Brazilian states on Monday as tires burned in protest of Jair Bolsonaro's runoff election defeat to former president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Many truckers endorsed Bolsonaro, who, as of Monday evening, was yet to concede the election, raising fears the far-right nationalist might contest the results. Bolsonaro spent Monday at the presidential palace without appearing in public and remaining silent, but his communications minister said Bolsonaro was working to determine measures to clear the highways and said the president would publicly address his defeat on Tuesday. Prior to the vote, he repeatedly made baseless claims the electoral system was open to fraud. But tens of thousands of jubilant Lula supporters didn't wait for official word from the president. They took to the streets of Sao Paulo on Sunday night to celebrate a stunning comeback for Lula, the 77-year-old former metal worker who governed Brazil from 2003 to 2010. His electoral win follows a spell in prison for corruption convictions that were later annulled. In his victory speech on Sunday evening, Lula called on his rival to do the right thing. The defeated president should have called me to recognize my victory. Up until now, he hasn't called. I don't know if he will or if he will concede. Lula has vowed to overturn many of Bolsonaro's policies, including pro-gun measures and weak protection of the Amazon rainforest. Even before he is due to take office on January 1st, it was said President-elect Lula will send representatives to next month's COP27 United Nations Climate Summit in Egypt. Bolsonaro, a far-right nationalist who has said he modeled his presidency after Donald Trump's, has echoed the former U.S. leader's baseless allegations of fraud in the 2020 U.S. election. There's fraud. Having repeatedly questioned Brazil's electronic voting machines, Bolsonaro has argued, without proof, that they are susceptible to manipulation. International election observers said Sunday's election was conducted fairly and efficiently. The Supreme Electoral Court declared Lula won 50.9 percent of votes, against 49.1 percent for Bolsonaro. With that, Bolsonaro became the first Brazilian incumbent ever to lose a presidential election. There's just eight days to go till the midterm election and in the U.S. and with control of the Congress hanging in the balance. It is coming down to the wire in some key battlegrounds. Tonight in Arizona, the fight to the finish. Republican candidate for governor Kerry Lake zeroing in on the economy in a state where inflation is among the highest, including gas prices averaging 4.30 a gallon. So we'll do what we can here in Arizona to give relief. Democrat Katie Hobbs has faced criticism for declining to debate her opponent. Tonight, though, blasting Lake as extreme, while in Georgia, a fiery debate in the governor's race. Democrat Stacey Abrams down in the polls, going after Republican Governor Brian Kemp on abortion rights. He refuses to protect us. He refuses to defend us. Kemp touting that Georgia was the first state to reopen after COVID. We're one new COVID variant away from Ms. Abrams wanting to lock our state down. There are at least nine competitive Senate showdowns that will determine the control of Congress, including Wisconsin, where Republican Senator Ron Johnson is running against Democrat Mandela Barnes. What Democrat governance has done to the state, what it's done to our country, is it's almost hard to describe. Democrats getting last minute help from former President Barack Obama. Mandela's opponent has done more than just about anybody in Congress to spread conspiracy theories about the 2020 election. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. 
There is more turmoil surging against former U.S. President Trump. As a prosecutor said in an opening statement in the Trump Organization's criminal tax fraud trial that Trump's real estate company cheated tax authorities for 15 years, while defense lawyers countered that the company's longtime chief financial officer had acted for his own benefit. Defense attorneys for the Trump Organization arrived at a Manhattan court on Monday for opening statements in the criminal trial accusing the organization of tax fraud. What do you want to to a good first day? What do you want the jury to know? Just be fair. Prosecutors say two units of former U.S. President Donald Trump's real estate empire cheated authorities over a 15-year period ending in 2021. But company defense lawyers put the focus squarely on former chief financial officer Alan Weisselberg, who worked for Trump for nearly half a century, accusing him of betraying the firm and succumbing to greed. Prosecutors say executives, including Weisselberg, didn't properly report perks like rent, car leases and bonuses. Prosecutors said Trump at one time personally paid for Weisselberg's grandchildren's private school tuition. Weisselberg has already pleaded guilty and agreed to testify for the prosecution in exchange for a five-month jail sentence. In his opening statement, Trump Payroll Corporation lawyer Michael Vanderveen said Weisselberg was acting on his own and out of pure self-interest. Weisselberg did it for Weisselberg, he said. Greed made him cheat on his taxes, hide his deeds from his employer, and betray the trust built over nearly 50 years. But prosecutor Susan Hoffinger said while the former CFO was a prime beneficiary, the scheme was bigger than him, that the company benefited by keeping top executives happy and saving on some taxes. Everybody wins here, she said. Of course, everybody but the tax authorities. If convicted, the Trump organization could face up to $1.6 million in fines, plus further complications to its ability to do business. Trump was not charged in this case, but it is among the mounting legal troubles he faces as he weighs another presidential run. The criminal trial is separate from the $250 million civil lawsuit filed by New York's attorney general in September that accused Trump, three of his children and his company of overvaluing real estate assets and Trump's net worth to banks and insurers. Trump is also facing a federal criminal investigation into the improper removal of government documents from the White House. Both units of the Trump Organization, which runs hotels and golf courses around the world, have pleaded not guilty to the charges. A unanimous verdict is required for conviction on each count of tax fraud, scheming to defraud, and falsifying business records. Rishi Sunak's new government in the UK is facing the next challenge as politicians from opposition and governing parties have demanded the Conservative government improve conditions at an overcrowded facility for migrants. Illegal migration is back at the top of the UK's political agenda after a difficult weekend for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's new government. A local border force centre in Dover was firebombed on Sunday with the suspect found dead at a nearby petrol station. Two people inside the centre suffered minor injuries. Any motive for the attack has not been established. But the incident has raised issues about the treatment of asylum seekers in the UK, notably at this migrant processing centre in Manston, in the south of the country. It's meant to house under 2,000 people for no more than 24 hours under British law. However, numbers have reportedly passed 4,000 after more people illegally arrived at the weekend. The local Conservative MP described the centre as a breach of humane conditions. And in Parliament, he pointed the finger of blame squarely at the new Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who's been accused of failing to provide enough hotel accommodation for migrants and turning Manston into a permanent refugee camp. However, Braverman denied the accusation. On no occasion have I blocked the procurement of hotels or alternative accommodation to ease the pressure on Manston. I'm afraid that simply isn't true. Suella Braverman resigned from her post less than two weeks ago for breaking the code of conduct which ministers must abide by in Britain. She was reappointed just six days later by the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Yet it seems that after just a week in the post, some are now asking if she can stay much longer.
Despite the easing of restrictions across the globe when it comes to the COVID pandemic, China is taking extra precaution, with strict lockdown measures causing thousands to be trapped inside Disneyland due to a case outbreak, only allowing visitors to leave on a returning of a negative test. A huge crowd of visitors stranded at Disney's Shanghai Resort on Monday after the park abruptly suspended operations to comply with COVID-19 prevention measures. All visitors at the time of the announcement were told they could not leave the resort until they return a negative COVID test. The lockdown at Shanghai Disney comes as COVID restrictions are once again gripping China, threatening new disruptions to daily life as well as to the global economy and critical supply chains. A Foxconn plant in central China that makes iPhones and employs about 200,000 people has been on lockdown for days. Many people have fled the facility, some climbing fences to escape, prompting nearby cities to draw up plans to isolate workers returning to their hometowns. A source with direct knowledge of the matter told that iPhone production at the facility could drop as much as 30 percent next month and that Foxconn is working to boost production at another factory to make up for the shortfall. Rising case numbers from outbreaks across China have prompted a tightening of local curbs and lockdowns, at the recent twice-in-a-decade Communist Party Congress, President Xi Jinping reiterated China's commitment to its zero-COVID policy, disappointing investors and countless Chinese frustrated by lockdowns, travel curbs and testing. The deadly virus monkeypox received little attention until the virus spread to the West this year. But in Africa, cases and deaths are going underreported and vaccines snapped up by the United States and Europe are in short supply. At a village clinic in Democratic Republic of Congo, six-year-old Angelica Lifafu is covered in hundreds of painful boils. Her uncle, 12-year-old Lisungi Lifafu's eyes are swollen shut, unable to tolerate the sunlight. They have monkeypox, a disease first detected in Congo 50 years ago. Cases have spiked in Western Central Africa since 2019, but the disease received little attention until it spread worldwide this year. Litumbe Lifafu is Lusungi's father and Angelica's grandfather. Another of his sons fell ill and died in August. Global health bodies have counted far fewer monkeypox cases in Africa than in Europe and the United States during the current outbreak. But that low account obscures a bigger African outbreak and death toll than official statistics suggest. During a six-day visit to the remote region of Tsopo, found around 20 monkeypox patients, including two who had died, whose cases were not recorded until reporters visited. More than a dozen health workers said a shortage of testing facilities and poor transport links make tracing the virus nearly impossible. That situation is exacerbated by a shortage of vaccines, stocks of which were snapped up by the West when the virus arrived at its shores. Both Angelica and Lusungi do not have access to vaccines or antiviral drugs. In Yalolia, where the children are being cared for, local health official Teo Pista Moloko questions why Europe, with fewer deaths and slower infection rates, would be at the front of the queue for immunization. In the West, only 10 people have died of monkeypox this year, figures from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show. In Africa, according to Africa CDC data, it's more than 130. Almost all are in Congo. The Africa CDC has acknowledged that its data does not capture the full extent of the continent's outbreak. Countries like Congo lack the funds to secure vaccines and rely on the World Health Organization and its partners. But so far, they have been unsuccessful, in part because of the global shortage. Congo's health minister said the country was in talks with the WHO to buy vaccines, but no formal request had been made. For Angelica and Lisungi, the future is uncertain. Without treatment, they will have to wait for the illness to run its course. They may recover, but also risk blindness or even death. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. More than 1,000 people in the capital Tehran of Iran are set to face public trials over unrest during recent protests.
North Korea is threatening more powerful follow-up measures should the U.S. continue what the North labels military provocations, referring to Washington's ongoing joint air drills with South Korea. The Menchiang Lab module has successfully docked with China's Tiangong space station complex about 13 hours after its launch atop a carrier rocket from a launch pad in South China. Thousands joined anti-Rwanda protests in the East Congolese city of Goma, denouncing Rwanda's alleged support of M23 rebels as Kinshasa recalled its interim acting ambassador from Kigali in further soaring relations. Border patrols shot at Venezuelan and Central American migrants with rubber bullets during a protest that started on the Mexican side of the border earlier that day. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with visuals of hundreds of disguised revelers parading through the streets of Key West, Florida as part of the 2022 Fantasy Fest Masquerade March. Good night.